Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second session today. Thank you for giving up your Sunday mornings. Um, this session is about good growth, bad growth, and building back better from an economic and a business point of view and the, the relationship between business and the rest of uh, our world. Um, my name's Paul Lindley. I uh, wear a number of hats, but I chair uh, the Robert Kennedy Human Rights UK organization um, that is putting on this, this week. Um, but I've been an entrepreneur. I founded Ella's Kitchen, the baby food company, the, the UK's biggest baby food company. Um, I've chaired Toast Ale, which is a fantastic uh, craft beer business that uses fresh surplus bread. Um, so it's a circular economy business. Uh, it, it believes food shouldn't be wasted and neither should you from a beer brand point of view. And um, uh, a tech company that helps uh, young people um, access healthier food at, at cheaper prices called Smash, and I chair London's Child Obesity Task Force for the Mayor of London. So lots of food and lots of, of business background there. Um, I'll sit down in my chair and introduce our fantastic panel. Um, we've got three of them here. We've got somebody waiting in his pixels, and we've got somebody who will join us in a few minutes. So um, first of all, I wanted to introduce uh, Kimberly Capanello. Uh, she's an award-winning Irish and American uh, conceptual and visual poet and she lectures at the School of English at the University of Leeds. Welcome, Kimberly. Then we've got, uh, next to her is uh, Sophie Benson. Sophie's a freelance journalist uh, working with a focus on the sustainable fashion industry and on the environment and on consumerism. Welcome. And um, a longtime friend of this festival all week, Keisha Thompson, Manchester's very own writer, performance artist, poet, and producer. And in pixels above us shortly is Sunand Prasad. Now, Sunand is a renowned architect and prominent voice on sustainability across the built environment and is currently chair of the UK Green Building Council. So Sunand will appear in a second. Welcome, Sunand. Right, to sort of set, to set context for the um, conversation that uh, will shepherd us all together uh, through in the next hour or so, um, I think that the, the context is that for so long, we've measured success in society in financial terms, uh, not in the health of our environment and the planet, uh, nor the welfare and well-being of our people. And we hope to look at um, how we can change the measures of success, the metrics that we use in business um, uh, and the economy, which really powers what the rest of the things we're able to do across the planet and people. Um, we'll question, hopefully, why anyone would really think that, um, that growth in itself and constant prof profitability uh, um, is, is even possible if it's at the expense of a, a healthy environment or a healthy people. And um, hopefully bring together the interdependence, we'll, we'll, we'll bring the narrative together an inter interdependence between profits, planet and people, and all of them have to thrive in unison to uh, have that sustainable future that we all want. So I had a quick question, actually, for audience participation at the very beginning, a very, very quick one, uh, and to the panel. Does anyone know where, what the genesis of the word company is? Where does it come from? Does anyone just shout out anything, or I will explain? Good, good question, good answer, and perhaps it could be, but it comes from Latin. It does relate to that, actually, in a way. It's come and panis, which is with bread. So bread from the countryside, from wheat. But, um, but really, in that context, it's about people sitting together and breaking bread and having an idea about a business or having an idea of the risk they want to take or the purpose that they want and, and, and working with other people to invest in the business, to work with other people to work with them and to sell stuff to other people. So in my mind, it's all about people. That should be the very heart of why we create businesses, why we create a pr prosperous economy. And if you think about it, the... Um, the, the circle of creating businesses that create products and services, that create profits, that create taxes, that pay for public services, that keep us civilized, and, and, and the circle goes on. Businesses is that, that, that complete center of uh, work. But obviously, company, it's not companies that make the services and goods. It's people within there. And it's us working. And so work is at the very heart of business. And the first thing that I, I'd love to do is to invite uh, Kimberly to um, speak around um, work. She's, she's written a poem specifically for this uh, festival, 
uh, target, uh, focused on Article 23 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which speaks to work. So, Kimberly, I, I just wanted to start to see if you could speak to us about why you chose this article, um, your thought process and how you developed this poem, and then perhaps read for us, in the very first time in public, um, your new poem. Certainly, yeah, it's great to be here. My first live event since an outdoor live event in Paris last September, so it's been a while. So, um, my, my poem is called Circling Work, and I had the great good fortune of growing up working in my parents' family restaurant, uh, Greg's Volcano Pizza in Elkhart, Indiana, running since 1957. And so work has been a huge part of my life. Um, my dad is a lifelong employee. I worked there until I went off to university. And often people have said, oh, you've become a poet and an academic, your parents must be so proud, as though there's some sense that I've advanced beyond them. And I often think about this idea of the value of work. I think the work that my family does and all of my colleagues at the restaurant is just as valuable as my work and very intellectual and all about community. So that's why I wrote this poem. It's a bit about writing. It's a bit about making pizza dough. It's a bit about Stonehenge. It's a bit about the sacred. The work of archeologists confirms that the ancestors hauled the sacred circle hundreds of miles to rehome it. This work, in turn, supports the ecstatic truth of a long-loved legend. In truth, the most important work I learned was circling the dough with my hand, working it over and onto itself, back home in the middle of the country. Though I learned from my ancestors and they from theirs, I never fully mastered it. I have since circled and worked over other things on other matters elsewhere. It doesn't matter that in different versions of another legend, life's very essence is sometimes rennet cheese, sometimes hard neck garlic, sometimes yeasty bread, sometimes it's the yield of trees. We can work with all of them and sometimes none. The creatures we collaborate with but don't master are careful where we are careless. They pick up the slack like we pick up the sacred, carrying it from place to place and on and on we graft and grind till it's lodged safely in the very heart of all matter. And so always in our restaurant, the friends of my grandfather go on talking over old country matters, sipping coffee from stackable cups. And on the other side of the counter, I work with the blankness, circling it with my hand as best I can. Thank you, absolutely beautiful and, and really wonderful to link nature, food, the environment and people through work. That's perfect, thank you so much. Right, we have one more panelist um, who is our special guest who um, this week had a conversation with Jude Kelly, um, who, who um, you saw earlier. Um, and hopefully this can stimulate our conversation. He's a giant of economic and political thought in this country, our former long-term chancellor and prime minister, Gordon Brown. Please roll the video. Gordon, uh, when I think of you, I think of somebody who is both a historian, uh, an economist, a, a practical philosopher and a man of action on a global stage. And all of those things I know you use to think about how the poorest and the most marginalized can be fully included and have full agency in our society as a whole. So I'm interested at the moment in how a, a sort of policy that I think I grew up with, which was that the world should just feed growth 
and the financial growth, and that this would then be dispersed across all countries and everybody would get richer, there'd be less poverty, there'd be less hunger, and this sort of growth idea would, would work for everybody in the end. But now that we're faced with a really frightening climate crisis, and people are talking about having to reduce the idea of growth, how does an economic policy get rethought so that people still can participate fully, but we don't destroy our planet? What do, is, is there a, a big change of financial philosophy happening? Yeah, economics has got to change. Uh, you know, for 250 years since Adam Smith wrote his Wealth of Nations, and I come from Kirkcaldy, the place where he actually wrote it, and talked only about economic growth and trade and social welfare, uh, we've had an economics that's been built around issues that deny the importance of a sustainable environment. Now, about 20 or 30 years ago, I made a speech actually saying economics must be based on three things, not two things. It's got to be economic growth, it's got to be social welfare, and it's got to be environmental sustainability. And really, that is the question. How do you avoid depriving, for example, hundreds of millions of people in Africa of electricity? Because we need to give them power, we need to give them the ability to use energy and at the same time protect our environment so we have got to deal with these trinity of objectives i don't rule out uh, economic growth but i want economic growth to be environmentally sustainable and i think the way to do that is first of all to insist that every company every corporate uh, has its carbon footprint declared and it has a mission statement for net carbon zero that every country every city every county does exactly the same and then we build, as I think we must do for COP26 in Glasgow in, in November, uh, a Green New Deal uh, so that we actually create employment out of new ecological projects uh, like, like wind power, wave power, and so on and so forth. And at the same time, uh, safeguard our environment far, far better. So forestry and so improving the way we use soil and using it more effectively in an environmental way. All these things are very much part of it. So. Uh, you, you've got to combine uh, your desire for economic prosperity with the need for social justice, with the need for environmental sustainability. Can that be solved? You know, but you, you've got to have a vision. You've got to persuade people. I mean, the more I've gone on in politics and public life, the more important it is that people have an idea of where you want to end up. They have a, they have a, they have a vision of what's possible. You know, when Martin Luther King made that m amazing speech on civil rights, which is more than, what, 50 years ago, uh, and he was speaking uh, to the crowd in Washington, and his speech wasn't really having much effect. Uh, and one of the people next to him, uh, Martha Jackson, Matilda Jackson, said to him, Martin, tell them about the dream, tell them about the dream. And so Martin dropped all his uh, printed notes, and he started talking about, I have a dream, I have a dream, I have a dream. And that's what made the speech memorable, and that's what made the cause uh, also something that people really wanted to join. And so we have got to give people this sense of a mission, of a project, uh, of a dream of a world that can actually deal with net zero, net zero emissions and at the same time uh, get rid of poverty. A movement is more than a campaign. It's about people coming together on a consistent basis, putting other differences aside, realizing the importance of the overall uh, cause that is being projected and at the same time, understanding there's a connection between everything that we do, and I think appealing to the best in people. Do you think that the G7, uh, sorry, the G20 rather, in, in October and the COP26 in November is going to produce a sort of dramatic psychological change in all these countries? Because finally people are saying there is a climate emergency. It's like, you know, the small islands have been saying it for years, but all of a sudden America can see it and Germany can see it because it's happening to their own citizens. Do you expect there to be a very different conversation? People are now accepting, as you said, there is a climate emergency. The question is, can we uh, generate enough energy so that every country accepts that it is going to benefit from taking action? And you know, with COP26, as we found we're in Copenhagen, and now we'll find in Glasgow, every one of the 195 countries in the world have got to sign up to something. This is not where America can say, I'm going to do this, and, uh, uh, and everybody else follows. Everybody's got to sign up to it. So one of the big things that's got to be agreed in the next few weeks, and it hasn't been agreed when we've tried to finance vaccination around the world, 
is that the West has got to put up the money, the richest countries got to put up the money to say to the poorest countries and to the coastal states who face the greatest dangers from uh, climate change, that we will finance your mitigation policies and we will help finance your adaptation. If you are prepared to come into this agreement with us, we will help you finance it. Now, in 2009, we said 100 billion would be provided to the poorest countries. It was not delivered and it is not even delivered now. And it's 100 billion a year that these countries need, that's dollars. And so the richest countries have got to put something on the table. And if they do, I think people will be prepared to trust that there is a way forward. If they don't, I think it will be a breach of trust with the poorest countries that will make COP26 very difficult to deal with. So we've got to get an agreement on support for the poorest countries, just as we should have had an agreement that we would pay for the vaccination of every poor person in the world. What's developed is a pessimism, and we've got to overcome that pessimism about what can be achieved when people work together. You know, if you go back to Tennyson, the great British uh, uh, poet, uh, he wrote this poem late in life, uh, it was called Roxy Hall, 40 Years On, and he was so pessimistic about the world, and he said, oh, cosmos chaos, or oh, chaos cosmos, when will it ever end? And Gladstone, who was the Prime Minister at the time, wrote to this poetry magazine attacking Tennyson, who had been his great friend, and said, Tennyson, why don't you look at what we've managed to achieve when we do work together? And go back to your first poem, which was uh, Loxley Hall, not Loxley Hall, 40 years on, uh, which said, dipped into the future as far as the eye could see and saw the vision of a world and the wonder it could be. And of course, this is the same Tennyson who wrote to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield, this great sort of idea that you just keep going and you have an ideal and you're going to achieve it. And so Gladstone reminded Tennyson late in life that his pessimism was actually counteracted by his own optimism at the beginning of his life and he shouldn't forget it. And I believe that that's what the message, that's the message that should be going out. We can achieve things together. You need social movements, you need everybody to understand the connection between what they're doing and what's happening in the world, but you also need to build on the best in people, the best that people can be and talk to people about the potential for the world and not simply talk about the things that are going wrong. I just want to end with your book, Courage, um, and how you feel about you know, the different people who, who stood up for change and social justice as you do, you know, you consistently do. Um, I mean, and you talked a bit about Robert F. Kennedy. As you know, this festival is sort yeah. of built around this idea of ripples of hope, that you must allow that hope can spread and you must always invest in hope and you know Robert F. Kennedy was a you know it was a short career sadly but is he one of the people who you take inspiration from? Yeah and I have a chapter in the book about Robert Kennedy and as you say and what, what he achieved because he put forward a vision of a united America in the last days of his life uh, where the racial tensions and the social tensions could all be dealt with by coming together around a common uh, philosophy that was about the best in people, but also a common policy that was going to spread the wealth uh, and deal with the poverty, poverty of America. So he was, for me, uh, an inspiration. And these speeches, I think, and uh, his, he quoted actually Tennyson, by, by the way, in, 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 his, in his speeches. And I think what Kennedy was pointing to is where you decide you can make a change. Remember, this was the Vietnam War. This was where racial riots were happening in America. This was where there was a huge amount of tension domestically as well as about international policy. And he said, look, you can unite around shared objectives. You can have a vision of what the future is. You know, I go, I go back to something uh, that's really interesting. You know, above us at the moment, the International Space Station is really sort of um, uh, going around the world, and every few hours it appears, and uh, it's above our heads. And the International Space Station arose out of Reagan and Gorbachev, who were not great uh, friends, but decided that they had to work together to stop nuclear weapons uh, uh, proliferating. Uh, and when Reagan and Gorbachev met, Reagan, who was really interested in Star Wars and everything else, said, if a meteor came and was about to hit America, uh, would you help us? And, uh, and Gorbachev said, of course. And Reagan said, we too. So this we too movement, he said, we too will help. And out of that was the nuclear agreement, then the International Space Station. And you know, for 30 years, American astronauts and Russian astronauts have been up there together, always one Russian, always one American. And despite the fact we have all these tensions in the world, 
we've managed in what was probably the most contested area of the world with the space race, who was to get to the moon and everything else, we've managed to find a way to work together. And I keep saying, if we can find a way to work together up there in space, uh, and we've managed to do so for 30 years, surely we can find a way to work together on Earth to solve climate change, to solve pandemics, to solve proliferation, to solve the problems of poverty. Uh, it must be possible. It has been done with the ozone layer. It can be done with climate change. So there we go. He's distilled um, the heart of a lot of the questions that we've got before us um, in that uh, interview. Um, and built in poets and poetry. What a pro uh, to, to his conversation. Um, I heard a lot about uh, collaboration, uh, and usually you hear about competition when you're talking about um, the economy, and certainly talked about the interdependence. But I wondered, if I could start with you, Sophie, what, what you took away from what Gordon said then, and how anything that he said might relate, relate to your expertise around convenience fashion, values and supply chains in fashion and conscious um, mm. consumerism. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly the, um, the, the message around collaboration, where we're seeing the most successful progress in the fashion industry is where um, you know the competitive differentiation is momentarily put to a side and um, brands are coming together for to make packs to share um, resources they're open sourcing their uh, technology for reducing um, you know water usage and, and all those kinds of um, issues that kind of really heavily plague the industry. Um, and, you know, there are, for all fashion's ills, there are some incredibly knowledgeable people. There are so many kind of technical um, experts in the industry. And when we're seeing that cross-collaboration, that's where we're seeing the, the steps forwards and that's where we're seeing the, um, the targets being posed and, um, yeah, really the progress. So, um, of course, there's competition between brands and, you know, one brand wants to sell more than the other, but there's a there's uh, there is evidence that coming together is not only kind of benefiting the um, environment, but it's benefiting the brands as well because they're future proofing themselves mm. essentially, which is really what we want to see. So, yes, collaboration um, has absolutely been key, and, w and we're seeing it more, um, particularly among the kind of uh, luxury sector. But I'm really hoping to see that kind of spread uh, more widely throughout the industry. Thank you. Sunand, um, hopefully we can see you on screen in a second. Yes, there we go. Thank you for waiting patiently. You've very much been felt in, in presence, uh, if not in body here. Um, Sunand, you come from an industry that, um, that really Churchill, I guess, was speaking about when he said, when we build our buildings, we shape our buildings, but thereafter they shape us, and how important envir environment is to our behavior and our economic behavior. Um, I wondered what your thoughts were on what Gordon said then, and perhaps um, what hope you have for a sustainable future. Sunan, do you mind? Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Can you hear me? Great. Yes. Uh, two things really struck me about, uh, well, several things actually. Uh, almost everything Gordon says at the moment is just so wholly endorsable, and you know, you just think if only people just did that, we'd, we'd be okay. <laughs> Um, including the keep the promise made at Paris to the poorer countries, to the, south, the global south, if you like, uh, and indeed the vaccine issue. But he talked about optimism and pessimism at length. Can I just start with that? Because, you know, if we position climate change and the future of the built environment as an issue simply of avoiding catastrophe, I don't think we will win the hearts and minds and the, the consensus which we really need, because what we're talking about is not just avoiding catastrophe. We're talking about building a far better, fairer, more just, more beautiful, more uh, a cleaner world where the air is fresher and we are at much greater harmony and a new profound relationship with nature. And that's what we're talking about. And, you know, regardless of your politics, there's absolutely nothing in that world, it seems to me, not to like. And I think that that's the story that we need to collectively tell to the point about optimism and pessimism. Because at the moment, we're kind of, uh, you know, uh, tread a line between the brigade for whom it will be all right on the night 
somehow, mm. and the other, on the other side, the doom-laden uh, view of the future. The, the other thing uh, uh, you, you asked me is about what are my feelings about the sustainability of the built environment and what part that might play. Well, I think, as probably everybody in the audience by now knows, something like 40% of our emissions are directly related to the construction and use of buildings. And therefore, we really need to make that built environment net zero by 2035, 2040 at the latest, because there's a lot which is much harder to make net zero that we will need to do by 2050 in current projections. And we, ha we know how to do it. Um, and what we don't know, we know that we can learn it. What's lacking is the concentrated national and global will to do it. And that's the, the biggest challenge we have. Uh, the industry is ready. There are companies signing up to race to zero uh, and adopting policies exactly as Gordon said. Uh, every company needs to have this policy, every individual almost. In fact, there's now a thing called households declare where it's a more of a democratic mass thing. We will uh, take it to our own hands to get to net zero because the government seems to be acting too slowly. And that's the spirit I think we need to the point also about collaboration, that the collaboration is kind of an everyday thing in solidarity with our fellow citizens. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I was reflecting from what he said on um, the failing of the economic model that we have, especially with relation to the food system that we have, where, where growth, good or bad growth, um, con consequentially delivers uh, monopolies. So there are a handful of food companies that um, we consume, 90% of what we consume is from them. We all, as we shop every, every day, we'll know that there's a very few number of supermarkets we have the choice of, uh, of shopping at. Um, how the supply chain is, total, is hugely unequal um, through, through, its, through the supply chain, and that um, at, the, at the, the bottom end of the supply chain is disproportionately women-led, and at the top part is there is next to no women, and um, consequently, uh, or inconsequently, there are um, uh, real challenges around where economic value is in that supply chain, um, and uh, where rights to work and, and to safely work are. Um, and I was reflecting on the, the toast ale business that I spoke about earlier, this brand of um, delicious craft beer that, that uses surplus bread, um, and the, the circular economy that we, we've managed to, to, to build into that. I know that 44% of the bread baked today will never be eaten, and tomorrow, and the day after, and the day after. And we've created this mad economic system where everyone in that supply chain is incentivized to produce more bread than we need, to create more farmland than we need, to uh, help us spend more money than we need on things that we don't necessarily, well, we're not using. Um, and how you know, the unequal distribution of, the, of power and of the economic benefit in the supply chain where the last person we buy our bread from um, takes most of the, 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 the money that we've spent. But that we have found a circular economy so that we can use some of that surplus bread in some, instead of some of the barley into our beer uh, and, and create a, an added value product. Um, Sophie, if I can come back to you and, and, and ask you if you have any insights around um, sustainable fashion, perhaps here in Manchester, but, but perhaps with a thought around what you were speaking about earlier about consumers and whether the industry is reacting to consumer power or it's leading consumers, or a bit of both. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a slight chicken and egg um, kind of situation because there have been people in the fashion industry um, kind of leading the way for 30 years and they have really um, kind of created a a roadmap, um, but I think a lot of what's happening now um, is certainly consumer-led. Um, in uh, 2013, there was a, a huge um, factory collapse, over a thousand people died um, in Bangladesh, and those kind of things happen on a slightly smaller scale really, really often, but because it was so huge, it really, um, it really kind of captured the public imagination and um, you know, people were really kind of outraged and it, was, it sort of really peeled back the layers on what's happening in fashion. Um, and that really galvanized people. Um, and, uh, you know, there were, there were tags within the rubble and they could relate to the, you know, the disasters that were happening. And so that happened really alongside the, um, the rise of social media as well. So what you saw was people kind of publicly asking the brands that they had trusted for years 
um, to do better and, and expecting more of them. Um, and so, you know, with the, with the information that we all have access to, um, the scandals really aren't kind of going on behind closed doors anymore. So, you know, there, there have been leaders within the sector for a long time, but I think what we're seeing at the moment um, with the, the steps being taken and, you know, the use of recycled materials and, and um, setting targets, that definitely, you know, very much feels like it's, it's a response to consumers who really expect more now. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Sunand, um, Sophie that obviously works with a, a consumer-facing sector. Your, your sector is perhaps less consumer-facing. I'm wondering where the impetus for change, for, for, for positive change, so we get good growth or we get a more sustainable economy, comes from in, in the world, work and world you see, and whether there are any new economic models that are emerging of um, how your sector works. And you're on mute again, Sunand. That's a really good question, uh, Paul. And just to say, uh, the sector is very, very widespread. There are over 2 million people in, involved, uh, employed in the construction industry, some of whom are uh, doing housing renovations, uh, back extensions, bathroom fit out, and so on. They're very much consumer facing. And interest, it's interesting the extent to which those smaller builders, this kind of atomized industry, which reaches all parts of life, is actually finding that there are uh, consumers who are interested, not just in getting the new kitchen, or the new extension, but when that's done, that their energy bills are lower, that their fit photovoltaic panels and so on. So there, there is that side. The, I think the most interesting economic models that are just emerging would be very much on the lines of the circular economy. That is to say, we don't, for example, need to own, you know, a, a, a building owner doesn't need to own the lifts, doesn't need to own the carpets. They, supposing those products were delivered as services, it would be then in the interest of the supplier of those services to maintain them, to recycle them, to look after them, to actually make them most economically useful rather than selling them once and forgetting about them until they're thrown away. The, you talk about the waste in, in, in bread making. Every seven years or so, entire office fit outs are thrown away. Offices are fitted out by new companies, and all of that stuff, you know, the windows, the partitions, the lights, everything, it, you know, and has been ending up in landfill. Thankfully, we've actually pretty much revolutionized, uh, uh, or at least got rid of, you know, taken the low hanging fruit of the landfill and recycling industry, uh, uh, or D, not recycling, that used to be the prevalent norm, and changed that quite a lot already. And already we are more circular than we were 10 years ago. But the real exciting trends for me are those economic models which will make it in everybody's interest to keep things at their maximum value for the longest possible time so that we don't use up the Earth's resources. And when we do dispose of them, and here skip companies are doing quite well. Skip companies are now uh, the best ones of them, are properly sifting through, making inventories of what they could reuse or actually uh, upcycle I mean, and without deconstructing them. And we are beginning to learn. And I think that's the direction where there are some really great uh, potentials. Yeah, repurposing our buildings. I, I know as we're talking about building back better, um, there's effectively a surplus of retail and office space in this country, and there's a deficit of um, wholesale, uh, wholesale um, distribution centers. Um, and that's that, that second part is because we, when we order something on, uh, online, we expect it tomorrow. That thing that we're buying is in four different distribution centers because we want it tomorrow, not in three days' time when it could be in one. But the idea that we repurpose our, our buildings outside of the business space where we've got people with unsecured tenancies and, and, and are homeless, yet we've got surplus shelter that we're not using is something that perhaps we can reflect upon. Um, if I bring the, the conversation back to um, the, the way we measure value in economic terms and, and whether there's opportunities to create people-centered value, people-centered metrics, um, and I see that as a return to that. When, when the Industrial Revolution first started and capitalism really took hold in the middle of the uh, 19th century, the measures that companies had then of success were not GDP or EBITDA or profit. Uh, they were moral statistics, they called them, but they were about how's this business helped increase education, reduce incarceration, increase health, 
and they measured themselves as, as centered in community around that, and therefore it's not beyond us to go back to, 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 the, to those measures. Um, I'll open the, 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 uh, the discussion up to the audience in a second. I'll ask the panel here one more question, but if you would like to think of any contribution you'd like to make, please, please, please get ready, there'll be a ro roving mic. Um, but uh, really anyone, um, and whether from a business point of view or a cons consumer point of view, um, any, any thoughts on um, your personal experiences around collaborations and around how we can put people more centered to um, how we interact with business and the, the, the companies that we, we consume from? Keisha. Oh, um, yeah, I just wanted to share that I think a few years ago I heard a TED talk from a leader in Bhutan and I was really enthralled to hear about gross domestic happiness as a metric, and I think it was developed in the 70s. And um, it's really encouraging to see that that's been taken on by other countries, like um, I think Thailand and New Zealand have been considering it in their policy making, so it's where decisions are not just led by GDP and what, what decision will now make the most money, it's also what will create the most well-being or um, collective happiness mm -hmm. in in the country and it's it's very much about hearing things like that that feel so tangible and about understanding models and um, I think that's what really helps me and when I think about just on a smaller level I work for contact theatre by the by example and um, when I found out that we are graded A as a public building in terms of being efficient and environmentally friendly, it really fed into my practice because I felt incentivized. I was like, okay, I need to keep that up. That's a certain standard. And I've made sure that when I'm contracting like my technicians and stage managers, for example, there's a clause about them being environmentally uh, friendly with their practice and there's no waste after a show and, and things like that. So I think it's just about how do we codify and make things really um, quite standard but accessible so that you feel that you're making an impact within within an organization yeah. and it doesn't feel like an add-on? Yeah, great question to consider. And I was thinking, Kimberly, from, from your family restaurant, family business point of view, mm -hmm. you know, most people employed in the private sector work for SME, small, medium-sized enterprises, whether the, the measures of success that your parents have mm -hmm. are wholly financially based or how they've approached building their business? I would say they're not, <laughs> they're not financially based in the sense that they're still work, <laughs> working quite <laughs> late in life, but they've also maintained a business that they can run themselves and have a core group of staff who've worked for us. There's about seven or eight people who've worked for us since I was born, people who held me as a child. And I think if there's one thing that we could all do is probably you know respect not just support local businesses which i know is a good thing to do but but support that sense of the value of of that sort of work and obviously if if our our team has stayed with us that long i think having ethical practices inbuilt in what you've done you know providing health care providing paid vacations all of these things that my father did before he was required to do so mm -hmm. um, he could have obviously been much richer had he not done that um, you know, I think that, that those sorts of practices are a part of many businesses, many very small businesses, but we don't hear about them because we tend to hear uh, about, you know, the larger scale corporations, the big success stories. And those narratives, I think, are, are really valuable and are literally right around us all the time. Yeah. Tied businesses to place to people, um, uh, like important. I wonder if there are any questions from the audience. Um, I can't see too much. There's a person in the middle there. Um, my question was particularly around kind of the stuff that was mentioned on circular economy and buildings. And I found that really interesting, the idea of these things as a service rather than as something that we just use and then throw away. And I wondered within construction company and those companies, how much are people now starting to understand these ideas and really implement them and see them as something that we need to be doing? And, you know, not just circular economy, but when you're building something, you know, what you're considering as green space and things like that. Because I think for people who are very embedded in this and have the knowledge, it seems almost, well, of course we should be doing that. But I think 
for an industry that's been doing something one way for such a long time, how much are people now starting to understand these new ideas and actually being able to implement them? Yeah. So, Nund, I, I, did you catch that question? Could you just summarize it for me, please? Well, as, as I understand it, it's really how much are the people within your sector and built environment um, taking on board what the rest of the, business, the rest of society is seeing elsewhere, and how how much from the inside are ideas around circular economy being able to be implemented into what we all imagine is kind of a fixed, un, um, un evolving sort of system that the building regulations and the building uh, industry is set in. Yeah, uh, I think I think it's uh, uh, the penetration of the building industry in society is so much that there's no, no difference between what it looks like from the inside and the outside. But I have to say that we are very much in, in the foothills of really seizing hold of this. Uh, you know, it's a big, unwieldy industry. It's very diverse and diffuse. Uh, the people who are doing the most advanced thinking are in an amazing place in many ways. Uh, if they were here describing their own attempts, for example, of recycling paint or uh, doing away with concrete uh, or recycling very, very small thinnings of timber, you would be, you know, we'd all be very uplifted by, by the stories that are being told there. But to go to an average building site, although there have been great improvements uh, in working conditions and health and safety, even in uh, reducing landfill, it's still early days and we, we don't have an industry it, which has been sufficiently invested into in terms of training to meet the real challenges that we have, climate change, circular economy, and so on. What, I mean, one of the things we should be doing as a nation right now is a massive investment in training people in the green recovery, in the green economy, training people to meet you know, these exciting new challenges, by the way. I mean, this is, this is an amazing opportunity to use your hands and brain and, and heart in a new way to, to create the possibilities which the door's been opened. I mean, people have shown what can be done. And I think that, you know, we need to get more people walking through that door and that can only be done if we invest in it. Uh, and if I can just pick up, you know, you, I have to say that uh, on the previous question about, uh, you know, what are the metrics which are not economic? There's of course systems like B Corp, which is a much, much more rounded way of accrediting the performance of a company. And there are the ESG, environmental social governance systems that many, many companies are adopting. My only worry is that th th there is a point at which measuring becomes an end in itself and somehow you lose the focus on what you're really trying to do. I think that can only be achieved by changing the composition of company boards and, and how they make decisions and what, what their priorities really are. So yeah, I'm, I'm all for uh, non-economic metrics, which is absolutely essential in fact, because otherwise you don't know where you are, but it's not gonna be enough by itself. Excellent, thank you. I, I'm very proud that Ellis Kitchen was one of the UK's first B Corporations. B Corporations um, changed their constitutions to move away from shareholder primacy, to move away from the point of the company, the point of the responsibility of the directors of the company to, to maximize shareholder returns, to optimize all stakeholder returns so that the business is equally responsible to create a profit for its shareholders, but to respect and enhance the environment and the welfare of the people that work within the businesses and in the community. And um, a, a natural extension from that was we're looking for solutions is a, a private member's bill that's with before parliament now called the Better Business Act um, that seeks to make that mandatory. That is the point of a company to, to, to optimize stakeholders' um, welfare rather than just the shareholders and take shareholder primacy away. Um, we had a question, I think, down here somewhere, this lady. Hi, thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's it sort of been half answered in a little way by the, the question that just came, but I'm interested both across, um, I guess the question's about how you make that leap between the, the niche to the mainstream in some of what's happening. So. In both, I think the built environment and fashion industries are quite interesting ones. So I'm, more from, I'm an urban planner, I'm more familiar with the built environment, you know, and you kind of look and you think, well, the vast majority, you know, 
we, we do know how to do things differently. All the technology is there. There's really exciting things happen. The vast majority of the built environment is done by volume builders, right? That I can't imagine, Barrett's not a B Corp. I can't imagine it ever becoming a B Corp. And actually, even though there's really exciting stuff happening, when you have conversations in those mainstream forums outside of your kind of echo chamber, it's, they, they don't really get this stuff. You can mm. sit in forums for hours and hours, and the environment and climate change never comes up until usually I bring it up. But I suspect, I guess, the equivalent in fashion of the volume house builders is somewhere like Primark, right? So, so even though there's exciting stuff happening, is, you know, how do you make that leap from niche to mainstream? Do you need to really more fundamentally change the rules of the game? You know, wh what is going to provoke that happening on a much bigger scale across kind of those two industries? Jacob? I mean, certainly in terms of fashion, it it's kind of needs to be a two-pronged attack. So on the one hand, we need uh, legislation. So if you think about how we all accept the 5P bag charge now, that's kind of completely normal, and we see that every day. Um, and we're seeing um, examples of that in Europe. So there's extended producer responsibility, um, and uh, where brands are basically having to you know, take responsibility for what they've put out into the world. Um, and through that, what we're going to see in the next few years are things like um, separate streams for uh, textile recycling. So it's normalized now that we, you know, we wash out our tins of beans and we put them in the, the green bin or whichever one it is. And so it will be normal that our, we, won't, you know, we won't just be putting our clothes in the bin. They'll be seen as a resource to be used again. So we need legislation to kind of um, uh, entrench that behavior kind of within society almost by force in a sense. But then the other side of it is really seeing it in, in popular culture. Um, like it or not, so much of fashion at the moment is just led by influencer culture. And the, the um, sort of prevailing message amongst influencers at the moment is, you know, buy more, have something new, treat yourself, you know, buying something is the answer for every emotion you could possibly have. Um, and we're seeing influencers, you know, taking up jobs as creative directors now, and that's, it's, it's really concerning. Um, but can you imagine if, you know, someone went on Love Island, for example, and then they spoke out against it, and they wore exactly the same thing every single day um, and made a point about it. We, do, we kind of need that, um, we need that shift um, on the stage where consumers are most likely connecting with the industry, which really is on social media. We need um, people to either emerge and kind of take their place and almost take some of the, the eyes away from these ones who are promoting consumption, or we need the ones who are currently promoting consumption to, to do their research and, and realize that what they're promoting is you know, incredibly damaging on a social and environmental level and change their messaging. Because we've seen how, how um, influencer culture has, um, has really kind of ramped up consumption. And it could really change consumer behavior in the same way, kind of in the opposite direction. So definitely, we need two things working together um, in harmony. Great food for thought. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move on now to um, ask Keisha to um, share with us and share the thinking behind a poem that you've written um, around Article 25. Um, and I was just thinking this, this you might think it was by design, but it's by accident. But I know Article 25 is about the foundational rights that we have. Uh, the rights to shelter, Sunand is all about buildings. The right to warmth and, and, and safety, clothes, and the right to, for, from hunger, and, and that's food. So uh, by accident rather than design, please tell us um, how you came about your poem and share it with us, please. Yeah, so, um, yeah, Article 25, as mentioned, I was thinking very much about food in terms of my angle for this piece. And I was thinking about the act of writing recipes and how that parallels with writing policy. Um, what does it mean to write something down? What is that gesture? It's kind of a, a gesture towards the future, towards someone who isn't there, um, but also it, can invite a level of complacency because sometimes you write something down and you're like, okay, that's done now. Um, and that's what I was kind of picking at in terms of thinking about human rights and policy in that sometimes, I think very much when you're living in a country like this and with a certain level of um, living conditions, you can just kind of think, oh yeah, well, we've got, we've got human rights and 
and not think about the exercise of that or the activity of that and how you can be more uh, proactive with it or interactive with it. So um, that was my thinking around the poem, and I'll share it now. How to make an Article 25. Ingredients. It starts with a bold notion that it should be written down. Equipment. I often think about the person who invented meringue. Their aching arm, legislating a dream for something different from the translucent, slimy substance before them. A whisk, gaveling hoax into soft white peaks, a sweetness in the air. Prep. My mother never writes anything down. She prefers for me to watch her in the act. Follow and repeat until it gets into my bones and I secretly take notes. Worried about being alone or failing to pass this on. Method. How many times do you lick your fingers before you reach for a pen and paper? Confident that you've come up with something good enough for everyone. A precedent of good taste. A full-bellied declaration to your future guests and your unborn children. An invitation to a never-ending banquet. Clear and concise. A petition of ingredients that you hope everyone can get hold of. A half-stained writ composed on the side of an apron. Something good has happened here. Knowing you will not be in this kitchen forever... You hope that this meal will outlive you. Alternative suggestions. Please rewrite this recipe in languages I cannot speak, with ingredients I do not know. Spill oil and soapy water and red wine and laughter <coughs> all over it and convert grams to cups and double up the quantities and do whatever you need to do to make it make sense to you until you don't have to look at it anymore, until the measurements are in your bones, until you can make a dance of this meal on a Sunday afternoon. And please put it through the letterbox of your neighbour and make it a visible bookmark in that novel that you donate to your local charity shop. Don't assume that someone will just find it. Or that someone's come up with something better somewhere else. This recipe was not written with self-doubt or serendipity in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Keisha. Beautiful poem and beautiful cadence to your voice. Um, I'll conclude now... Um, we explored in this last hour um, some of the challenges before us. Um, we've all got an opportunity to build back better. We're all connected to the economy, whether we invest through our pensions, we work for companies, or we consume from them. Um, and we've got an opportunity to think about, and there's lots of things to digest from today, around how we can reset that economic system, how we can design it for interdependence, how we can invest in it for justice, and how we can account for all stakeholders rather than just shareholders within it. And, and I guess it's our choice um, to what solutions come from that. Um, I, th I thought I'd close by sharing some words from Bobby Kennedy um, during his presidential campaign in 1968 when he specifically addressed the, the, the issues that we've been talking about through um, looking how we become obsessed by gross um, national product. Uh, as a measure of the success of a com uh, country. Um, and, and he said then, um, our gross national product now is over $800 billion a year. But gross national product, if we judge the United States by that, that gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising. 
and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and the jails of the people for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwood and the loss of our natural wonder in chaotic sprawl. It counts napalm and counts nuclear warheads and the armored cars for the police to fight the riots in our cities. It counts Whitman's rifles and spec knives and the television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, except neither our compassion or our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And it can tell us everything about America, except why we are proud to be Americans. So does putting so much importance on the measure of turnover of our companies, of profit of our companies, of GDP of our country, work out what success is for us? Does it tell us anything about Britain today or why we may be proud to be British? Thank you very much. Well, hello, everybody. Here I am again, Jude Kelly. Hi, Sinan. Oh, he's gone. Um, <laughs> this, we're just doing a, a little intervention, as uh, artists often say. Um, some of you have been here for the whole weekend. Some of you just arrived this morning. Um, I'm the artistic director of the Ripples of Hope Festival. The conceiver of the idea that we should have a festival and the CEO of Ripples of Hope UK, uh, Dennis Marcus, has been an absolutely brilliant spine uh, allowing all of this to come about. And he's leaving the organisation um, to, to um, hand over to Nicola Walker. Uh, and Paul is the chair of the organisation. Uh, we, together, I think... We've schemed, haven't we? We schemed to just bring him on stage at this point uh, to say thank you on behalf of all of us uh, for everything he's done. So why don't you come on, Dennis, so that we all know what we're talking about here. I think you're um, and, uh, and, and Nicola, who is the new CEO, you might as well see what she looks like. Here's what she looks like. <laughs> I, I, I just say a few words that, I mean, Dennis, I'll let Dennis speak for himself, but he has some really, really taken the convictions that he learned from his mother, who's here actually, uh, his father, and, and the communities the white South African communities fighting against apartheid where he grew up uh, and been inspired by all of those people, particularly Mandela. And, and that has informed so much of what he has done ever since. And that's been an inspiring thing to see and to work with. So we're going to be ever in your debt, Dennis, as well as really missing you. Paul, can I hand to you? Well, um, we've got the Dennis here. I think this shows the power of words. Um, which poets inspire with us every day, but politicians and leaders do all the time. There's Bobby Kennedy speaking about racial justice to 500 people there. And um, I've chosen to put at the bottom here uh, some words that he often spoke, which George Bernard Shaw uh, uh, spoke in the first place, wrote in the first place. And I've changed it a little bit for Dennis, but it, he, he often said, Bobby Kennedy, some people see things as they are and ask why, but you dream things that never were and ask why not. Thank you so much for all your work over the last three or four years. Let's just put that down there for you. I'm supposed to say stuff? I, I, I'll take your human right to champagne off you for a second. <laughs> I knew you would. I could always rely on you, Jude. Um, uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you all for coming to the Ripples of Hope Festival. I hope you're having a great time. Are you having a great time? Yes. You having a great time? 
Goodness. Um, uh, and, and huge gratitude to Jude as artistic director and uh, everybody who's spoken, Keisha, who's been with us the entire journey. Um, as I know many of you have, uh, I'm very aware that my mother's looking at me right now. Um, and, you know, they're uh, on, uh, on trial and in prison with Mandela was a guy called Andrew Mangeni, uh, who's a great hero of mine and a great friend of the family. And uh, my second son, uh, Jack, his middle name is Mangeni. Uh, that gives you a sense of importance to, to me. Um, and he always talked about how what we do and every day is shaped by what we understand about the world um, and how we understand how we came to be here uh, and, and, and what the world looks like. And that, that happens through conversations. It happens through beautiful art. It happens through beautiful poetry. It happens through people coming together in conversation. So I'm so grateful that you've joined us at the Ripples of Hope Festival. And we hope that you know uh, your understanding of the world is 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 a bit richer, a bit fuller, um, and and that you feel more connected to the people around you. Uh, and if if you feel that way, then we've done our job. So thank you, thank you. And, and a five-day festival in a pandemic is an inordinate amount of work. So we have an extraordinary. And and I, I would have planned this out if I knew I was speaking, but I wasn't. So. I'm, I'm just going to go by people uh, I see. Nicola as the new exec director, um, you know, is, is going to be working with uh, assets, resources, programs built by an extraordinary team. I'm looking at Ella over there. Uh, a round of applause for Ella. <laughs> oh, let's go. All right, we're looking at Rachel. There we go. We're looking at Maria, who is right there at the back. We're looking at Shireen. And Catherine and Caroline, who are over there. Simon, who's been supporting me all week, who's over there. So just a huge thank you for the team. Sugra. Thank you for coming. Oh, Sugra, where are you? I couldn't see you. Sugra, somewhere. Sugra. <laughs> We've led an education day, which is extraordinary. Um, so, yeah, just an extraordinary team coming together. <laughs> Dennis has missed out. I did this last time. <laughs> And Laura, who is right there, who is my wife and patient with me. You see, this is what happens when, uh, when you don't you know, let a guy prepare. <laughs> it's what's called spontaneity. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Uh, Enjoy lunch. I'll ask you for one last clap for a fantastic uh, panel today. Um, thank you so much, guys.